Welcome to the Character Chronicles, the people show. Checking the Pulse of Rescue Nation brought to you by X Cancer. Check them out at xcancer.com. Today we've got a bit of a unique show. From 1993 to 1997, the Nebraska Cornhuskers, the football program would have one of the most dominant eras in college football history. It was more amazing than the three national titles in four years was just how they did it. Played with controversies, injuries, and tragedy. Find out how one of the most uh, one program became the most dominant of all, leaving their mark in college football history as one of the greatest of all time. There's a day-by-day documentary series that's going to be coming out soon that documented all of this, full of interviews and behind the scenes. And today, I'm joined by legendary Husker football coach Tom Osborne. How you doing, Coach? I'm doing fine, Adam. Thanks for thanks for having me on. The day-by-day documentary that is coming out really focuses on your run as a head coach, particularly during the the 90s and during the the championship run in the mid-90s. Now, it also talks about, obviously, the success on the field, but also some of the struggles that happened off the field. So I'm curious what it was like for you to go back and discuss those things, the success on the field and the struggles off the field, and look back at those things you know, 25 years later or so, and just what that was like for you. Well, as you know, sometimes time distorts memories. And uh, so uh, I I hope that I was able to accurately uh, recollect what happened. But I think the thing that most fans will find to be of most interest will simply be the um, the feelings of the players, the players, some of the interactions, some of the things I, I never knew. Uh, I have seen part of the documentary, but not a whole lot of it. But uh, I discovered a lot of things that were going on among the players, between players, uh, that uh, I'd never been aware of. Because usually players aren't going to come in and sit down in the head coach's office and say, well, you know, I, I have a toothache or my girlfriend isn't treating me well or whatever. And um, and so I think that uh, the dialogue of the players will be something that will be of, uh, of, of great interest and somewhat unique about the uh, about the documentary. Now this is a quite a, a run that happened in the mid '90s, as we all know. Why why do you think it's taken so long? for this to be documented, put into a movie, talked about years later. I know the 95 season was talked about for a 30 for 30 show at one point. Are you glad it's finally happening? And also, there's a lot of young fans out there, Nebraska fans, maybe not Nebraska fans, who aren't aware because they weren't around at this point in time. Do you think that this could maybe convert some of those Nebraska or non-Nebraska fans into Nebraska fans? Well, it, it certainly could. I, I think probably today, if you uh, if you went to a football game, that half the people in the stadium would have only vague memories or no memories of, uh, at all of the 80s or the 90s or the 70s. And so it's just old people like me that uh, remember <laughs> all those things. And so um, I think it's it's kind of a good refresher. And uh, if you look at the the uh, total scope and the sweep of Nebraska football, it was a, an important era. And um, so anyway, Josh Davis, uh, a former player, got the idea that he wanted to doc- have a documentary, particularly on the 90s, but also reflecting on some of the other times in Nebraska football. And they really worked hard on it and it really had a tremendous number of interviews with former players. And I, I think those things will be the, the, the really the heart and soul of the whole, uh, the whole story. You, uh, you had a lot of outstanding teams and athletes that played for you for over 20, 20, 20 plus years, 25 years or so. This documentary, Day by Day, is going to cover some of that. Your 80s run with the scoring explosion. You had Turner Gill, Mike Rozier, Irving Fryer, then you had other great players. Uh, the Sandman, Broderick Thomas, Steve Taylor, Mark Mumford, Danny Newman, Kenny Clark, tons of NFL talent, tons of NFL talent on those teams. Would you say that your 90s run with that group what would you say separated them? Did they have more talent or what helped them to achieve and kind of get over the hump, so to speak? Well, we, we did have some uh, great teams 
83. I think both of those years we, we lost one game in 82. We lost back at, at Penn State uh, some uh, rather controversial calls. And uh, then we ran the table and uh, played very well. Had some great players. And, and of course, 83, we were undefeated uh, going into the Orange Bowl and played Miami down there on their home field and uh, just didn't make a, a two-point conversion, which probably normally we would make that, that uh, play and uh, and lost by one point. And uh, so uh, sometimes to win a national championship, you have to have some good players, and, but you also have to have a, good, a little bit of good luck. There are very, very few teams that go through undefeated that haven't had a, a good bounce here and there. And certainly 1997, that was a game. In Missouri, we had a fairly improbable play that enabled us to tie the game and then win in overtime. And uh, probably the only the only teams I can think of that won national championships where we really weren't threatened very much. 1971, even though we had a very close game in Oklahoma, and then, of course, in uh, 1985, uh, nobody really came very close to us at all. And uh, so, um, but we had a lot of great players. And if you look at some of those teams in the in the 90s, um, I think uh, probably 75% of our starters eventually played in the uh, in the NFL. So, out of the 22 starters, you'd see at least 14, 15. Of those guys playing in the NFL, so the talent level was, was pretty high. But I think the thing that was probably most significant about the uh, the '90s was the uh, the team chemistry and the uh, the level of commitment of the players. I, I, there, there were things that I did not even have to mention or do as a coach because the uh, the players handled it themselves. There's a tremendous desire to be the best, and uh, they, they wouldn't tolerate uh, somebody uh, getting out of line. And so, uh, with the Unity Council and some of the things that were initiated, I, I think that uh, there was a lot of self governance and, and a very high level of motivation. And it was, uh, it was interesting to to see that all unfold, and uh, probably something that people, if they see the see the film, will. Uh, come to realize was uh, was kind of unique because uh, we live in, in a society that tends to be somewhat me first and um, and those players overcame that tendency to a very high degree do you have because obviously you've coached tons of teams over the years tons of husker football teams do you have a team that you've coached over the years and it could be you know maybe a team that won a championship maybe not Maybe a team that's a little bit more, you know, if your favorite team, a little more dear, near and dear to your heart. Maybe there was something you had to overcome during the season that was more challenging, or maybe a season that sticks out more in your memory, maybe than a, a few of the others, just because of some of the things you had to endure during that particular football season. Well, I think 1994 it was a kind of a unique team. In '93, uh, we. Uh, we were undefeated going into the bowl game and uh, played Florida State, and we were uh, 17 point underdogs in the game. And even Bobby Bowden, a uh, Florida State coach, said that, that we played well enough. Nebraska played well enough to win, probably deserved to win. I think that was 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 a case. There were some things that happened in the game uh, that were surprising to me. And as far as officiating and those types of things. So uh, anyway, um, that was a, a, an interesting team. And then 94, I think that loss to uh, Florida State kind of galvanized that team. And uh, their whole summer conditioning they had on the scoreboard, I think, a minute and 16, which is when, when Florida State went ahead of us to, to win the game. And, uh, and their whole their whole goal was to make sure they didn't go short again. And uh, and so in that season, Tommy Fraser was a great quarterback, and uh, he went down with blood clot 
the back of his leg and and was deemed out for the season after about the third game of the season. And uh, we had a good team that probably wasn't as talented as some teams we've had. And uh, we're very interested in and we won seven straight. And, um, and Brooke had, uh, had a collapsed lung. And uh, our third team quarterback, Matt Terman, took over. And so uh, we had we had some significant injuries. Uh, Mike Mitchell was uh, was hurt, and he was probably our leader in the secondary. But it just seemed like no matter what happened to that team, there was enough resolve that uh, that they were going to get it done one way or another. So we had injuries on offense, the defense would step up, and uh, we went down and played Kansas State. They had a really good team that year. And it was rainy and cold, and uh, and we ended up just handing the ball to Lawrence Phillips about 35 times <laughs> offensively, and uh, he uh, kind of carried the day, and the defense played great football. And uh, so we, we won them all that year, and, uh, and that was probably uh, one of the most satisfying years that we had. We beat Miami in the Orange Bowl, which was always difficult on their home field. To, uh, to win that final game. And um, so that game kind of stood out, or that season stood out. And then, of course, 95 was was uh, the most talented team that I coached. And, and we were number one wire to wire with no serious challenge. And that was, was interesting. But then we also had the Lawrence Phillips deal. And uh, we kind of became a pariah the year before. Everybody thought we were wonderful because we... <laughs> Overcame adversity and then 95, well, uh, everything flipped on us from a national publicity. And in some ways, that was the most difficult year that I experienced. But uh, it is what it is. And uh, so, anyway, I think uh, the documentary details all those things and some of the things that some people might not have ever understood that were uh, involved in it. All right, just between you and me. All right, I think enough time has gone by. Was the Penn State receiver out of bounds in 82? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I remember, I remember uh, Joe Paterno. <laughs> this was several years later. I, I was around Joe quite a bit, and he, he never would have met him. But finally he said, you know, you know, Tom, he said, I think that guy was out of bounds. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe <laughs> just was, a smidge. <laughs> All right, ninety the ninety four Orange Bowl. Was there a block in the back on the Corey Dixon punt return? Did you ever see one on film? No, they're, they're really. I, I looked at that thing uh, dozens of times, and there was never a block that you could even say resemble the clip. And uh, it was just kind of strange. And uh, but you know, those it's part of football. But uh, it was. Uh, it was probably the only two or three games where I, I felt some uh, officiating came into to play. And uh, one of them was against South Carolina a uh, long time ago. And and, uh, and then certainly that uh, game with Florida State. And uh, and then uh, there's there just uh, – but most of the time the officials were very good. And uh, – but you feel bad because you know some, for some of those players, like in uh, in '93, um, uh, those guys didn't have another chance to win a national championship, and they played well enough to win one that day. And uh, Trevor Alberts is on that team, for instance. He didn't have another shot at it, and uh, so I, I felt bad for those guys. Yeah, no, that's a great point. I won't even ask about William Floyd, which should have been a fumble, but I want to thank you for joining me, taking the time. I truly enjoyed it. For those that are interested in the day-by-day movie event, the documentary series, tickets are on sale now. All right, You can get them. Uh, they, the, the movie will be playing at the Rococo Theater All right, the weekend of May 13th and 14th. All right, and you can get tickets right now, daybydaymovie.com. So tickets are on sale now, daybydaymovie.com. And it will be at the Rococo Theater with showings. And check it out the weekend of May 13th and 14th. Thank you for taking the time, and thank you for joining me, Coach. Thank you, Tom.
Okay, Adam. Well, thank you for having me on, and uh, hope we'll see a few folks down at the Rococo. I'll be there, and probably be the first time I'll see this this documentary. And so I hope it doesn't bring up too many bad memories, <laughs> and mostly good memories. So anyway, yeah. thanks for thanks for uh, having me on. Until next time, Husker Nation, go big red and always remember, throw the bones. This show is brought to you by X-Cancer. Join the fight at xcancerstore.com and support your loved ones, your neighbors, and cancer fighters all over the world and help them gain access to revolutionary treatments. xcancerstore.com has a wide variety of t-shirts and merchandise supporting a wide variety of cancer battles so you can show off the colors that matter. Proceeds from each purchase not only help those at home, but also cancer fighters in Tanzania, Africa, Check them out at xcancerstore.com.